the first challenge you heard about Australia, US and every talk was giving about the demand in China is going up and therefore there are great export opportunities. I didn't find any mention of literally where the Indian demand is going to go. We are 1.3 billion today and by 2022 India will surpass China in terms of population and those people have to be fed. China is more or less through with its poverty question, a little bit is there but not as much. India is still one-fifth of Indians are still under the poverty range. So they will have to come up. What most of the multilateral agencies are projecting for India next five years, ten years, even fifteen years, the growth rate overall is going to be seven to eight percent per annum. For China it's going to be decelerating. By 2022 we were looking at your Australian statistics yesterday, China comes to 5.5. By 2022, India is still hovering between 7 and 8 percent growth rate. Currently, about 40 to 45 percent of the expenditure, not income, because our saving rates are still pretty high, 25 to 30 percent range. 40 to 45 percent of the expenditure an Indian is spending on food. So you can imagine when the incomes are rising, more number of mouths and you have high expenditures on food, what is going to be the pressure on agriculture? You have limited resources, land and water. The average holding size, I was trying to check with Trish yesterday on Australia and look at thousands of hectares versus 1.15 hectare. That's the average holding size in India. So there is no comparison of Australia or US here, but we still feel proud that our size is much bigger than average holding size in China. <laughs> because China, when I started studying China, had 0.4 hectare as the average holding size. Now it has come to about 0.7. That's the big progress in the last 20-25 uh, years because China has been able to shift quite a few of their people off agriculture to off-farm activities. So looking at what the challenges are, there is no way but to innovate all along the value chain in agriculture if India has to feed itself in a reasonable manner. Today, India is feeding whichever the way it is feeding its population, but also a net surplus exporter of agriculture. Last two years, 14, 15 and 15, 16, our agriculture year runs from July to June, so it's half there and half here. Last two years were back-to-back -back drought, and that back-to-back -back drought was the fourth such event since 1900, and we still survived. There was no famine conditions, there was pressure, and India was still a surplus exporter. But 13-14, which was our normal year, India exported $42 billion worth of agri-exports, and the imports were about $17 billion, so there was a net of about 25, which came under stress during the last two years, but we are back this year in 16-17, it's again a bumper crop, uh, one of the record crops and therefore what as Australian exporters would be looking at last year we were down in pulses by about uh, five to six million tons and our imports of pulses went to 5.8 million tons and the chickpea prices here doubled because we were importing from Australia but this time chickpea production which is coming right now in the market is 30% higher than last year, at least by government figures and compared to the, what the market was feeling earlier, it's going to be 40 to 50% higher. So your chickpea prices are going to tumble by almost 40, 50%. So that's going to be the implication on Australia. It's not very good for exporters, but India will be back on track. 
So looking at the innovation matrix, I think all along the value chain there is a continuous effort to innovate and get better from lesser resources. That's the idea. Whether it is agriculture food policies, whether it is the production process, whether it is the supply chain management or press processing and value addition, what we are doing there. Now one of the things that I want to put on the table, because many a times we talk about technologies coming in agriculture, which is perfectly fine, but there is a big mess that many countries, including my own, has created in policies, and I think big savings can come out of that if we try to innovate in those policies. I'll give you one or two little examples. We have about $22 billion being pumped into the system as food subsidy for those who are somewhat uh, poor, and there is a 90% subsidy. What it costs the system and at what price they are given, it's a 90% subsidy, literally. And that is being given through cheap food. You know, if rice is costing you 30 rupees a kg, it is given at 3 rupees a kg. Uh, wheat is costing you 22 rupees a kg, it is given to the poor at 2 rupees a kg. Now, because of this price policy to attain equity ends, there is a massive leakage in the system. 40 to 45 percent of the food doesn't reach them because of the poor governance in the system and it leaks away. What the new government, when it came up, the first committee that was set up, high-powered committee, was on food management system, or the part of that committee. And we looked at this entire thing that there is an immediate need to switch from price policy approach to income policy approach, directly give the income into the accounts of the people and let them go to the market and buy from it. The government said this is one of the biggest programs in the world today. Before we try this, let's try some smaller schemes. Today about 84 schemes have been put into income policy approach, what we call the direct benefit transfer into the accounts of the people directly rather than through price policy approach. And we have saved about $7 billion out of that 50,000 crore saving net. That's what the Prime Minister has been talking about. There are pilots going on into the food subsidy and fertilizer subsidy scheme. And hopefully, when they get transferred, we feel at least one third of that can easily be saved. And if that is invested in water, I think Indian agriculture would be on a comfortable range for the next 20, 25 years. What about uh, production technologies? And I would like to take you a little bit of history and then where the future is going to be. India was known in 1960s a country from ship to mouth. We were heavily dependent on USPL 480 imports. Every 15 minutes the ship was leaving. That was the story. And then the Green Revolution came as a disruptive technology. And today, despite these two years of drought, India turned out to be the topmost exporter of rice in the world. Three years, 12, 13, 13, 14, 14, 15, India exported about 62 million tons of cereals, wheat and rice primarily. 16. Just last year, we imported 5.5 million tons of wheat, some from Australia also because of the droughts, the stocks were exhausted, but this year the crop is going to be very good. What I want to say is that from Green Revolution, the next disruptive technology in India was a very institutional innovation. It's not the technological, it's the institutional innovation. And that was all done by the smallholders. And this was the white revolution in the country in the 70s and 80s. I remember in 1951, India was producing only 17 million tons of milk and US was at 53 million tons of wheat, uh, milk. Today I think US is about 94, 95 million tons of milk. India is at 155 million tons of milk. And this year we are expecting 160. And that's not by any big herds of 200, 400, 600. It's by an average herd size of just four. Just four. It's a backyard, 
farming going on. India is, the problem is only 21% of that is being processed through the organized sector. The rest is still waiting for investments to come and that could be a wonder. Now this is what I say because it was institutional innovation. Because aggregating even a one liter surplus milk is tested by its fat content and priced accordingly. And there are millions who pour their milk together, chilled, pasteurized, homogenized, and then within 24 hours, there is a train that goes every day from Gujarat to Calcutta, about 2,500 kilometers across the country of milk, going from the surplus to the deficit area. So this wonder can be done by smallholders who are just average holding size of 1.15. I think the third wave of change came again from seed technology, and that was not green, that was not white, that was more the gene technology. And that was on 26th of March 2002, when the Prime Minister of India took a bold decision to allow BT cotton into the country. India was just self-sufficient at that time in cotton, marginally importing or exporting. Within 10 years, the production of cotton went three times from 12 million bales to 36 million bales, and India became the second largest exporter of cotton in the world. I feel the future, the way it is coming, it's somewhat slow. The next revolution in the offing is brown revolution. And that's where sustainability questions and the precision agriculture, that is what is coming on the way. This is what uh, overall uh, the gene revolution I talked about. We worked out between 2002 and 1415 how much gain it brought about to India uh, compared to business as usual, uh, what the new scenario was and it was about $55 billion worth of gain, cumulative, between 2002 to 2014-15. That's where. There's another thing that is coming up. I talked about uh, this cotton. Uh, in the gene revolution, uh, drought-tolerant varieties are coming in. So far, India has not allowed uh, GM food crops although we have our own uh, BT brinjal and uh, mustard just waiting for the final clearance, uh, but it's uh, politically uh, very debatable for the last four or five years, BT brinjal uh, has been on uh, the uh, hold on. Uh, but we are expecting hopefully the mustard uh, will be given a clearance. But what is coming up now is biofortification. And all of us know what happened last year. The world food price went to these uh, four stalwarts, uh, bringing about uh, biofortification. So it's not just filling the stomachs, but also giving better uh, nutrition. And uh, India is pretty poor in terms of uh, iron deficiency or uh, zinc deficiency. And that's where the new releases. Uh, pearl millet iron rich has already been released in India. Wheat is just waiting any day. Uh, the zinc rich uh, wheat would be uh, hopefully released. It's under trials. And uh, the coming ones uh, could be even uh, vitamin A uh, rich uh, or zinc rich rice. Uh, these are the things. GM rice, uh, the so called golden rice, is still under debate, and that's on the hold. But this is another uh, revolution uh, that may be. So this is what I talked about, uh, the, some of the varieties that have been released and some are just in the waiting. That's from the seed side. What's happening to the other source, uh, resources, particularly fertilizer, water, what's coming up there? Uh, fertilizer, this is interesting that uh, India, uh, urea particularly, is highly subsidized in India, almost uh, at one third the cost. And again, this issue of uh, uh, price policy, uh, that was leading to massive diversion of urea to non-agriculture uses. It also is diverted to Nepal and other countries, uh, but uh, this non-agriculture uh, use of urea 
because it was highly subsidized and India came up with this innovative idea of neem coating. It's a oil spray of neem uh, which has some uh, properties uh, so that the release of nitrogen is slow and that is where the gains are in terms of productivity and in terms of savings. Uh, the government claims uh, are very much uh, about one to two billion dollars it has saved. Uh, there is another uh, something called mycorrhiza. Uh, the private sector, Terry, uh, has uh, set up world's uh, biggest facility of uh, mycorrhiza. You coat the seed with mycorrhiza. It's a fungus type and it spreads and draws more of nitrogen uh, from the soil. Uh, it's uh, one of the things which can reduce uh, urea, chemical urea application even up to 50 percent. So those trials I personally saw about uh, 10 years back. Today about 60 companies are selling this as a part of the biofertilizer package. So these are the types of innovations, I think small ideas, but gradually uh, looking up into more and more of uh, 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 scaling up. Uh, India is under tremendous pressure of water and uh, it's already a water stressed uh, country. Uh, although we are biggest exporter of rice, which is a contradiction because exporting rice means literally exporting virtual water. Uh, one kilogram of rice is 3,000 to 5,000 liters of water and that is depleting our water table in some of the areas, especially Punjab and Haryana belt, which was the seat of Green Revolution. So what they have been trying is doing pilots and now scaling up some of those things. Uh, drip irrigation, it's not new, world knew it for quite some years, but today India is the biggest player in drip irrigation. It's about four million hectares already under it and it's scaling up in a big way. Uh, normally we thought drips would be applied to horticulture crops. But the pilots for the last three years are showing drip in rice can reduce the water consumption by 66%, increase the productivity by 33%, save on fertilizers when it is put along with fertigation. So those things are coming up and you are having uh, something interesting uh, through. Uh, I also showed something on the hydroponics and uh, aeroponics. That's also coming in and those things are, uh, you can see uh, in the hydroponics, strawberries are being grown just like an industrial structure uh, without soil and you can have hydroponics and the other is the asparagus being grown uh, uh, in aeroponics. So this is the future of agriculture and many of the companies are pitching in this type of a thing. This is something interesting. Uh, Solar. Solar costs today. You know, five years back when we looked at solar, the costs were three times the cost of producing energy from thermal uh, sources. Today, the latest bids in India are less than three rupees, that's less than five cents per kilowatt hour. And that is cheaper than thermal. And that is a game changer. And that's a game changer and India has set up a target of 100 gigawatt by 2022. So it's scaling up in a major way. But this particular slide shows you the innovation that solar can be the third crop for the farmers. It is on the same fields at about nine feet high. And you can have two crops because solar will help you to give irrigation. So normally you can have two crops in a year on the ground, but the surplus solar power can be fed into the grid. And that will be your third crop. It gives you a sort of an insurance forever. So this is what the pilots are already going on. We are in touch with the government that at least out of 100 gigawatt, uh, 10 gigawatt should be from the farmer's fields uh, like this, and that can augment the income. Of course, solar uh, pump sets are very much there, uh, about 50,000 pump sets already working and scaling up very, very fast on this question. Cold storages. India has about 7,000 cold storages, 90% of that going for potatoes, and they used to run primarily on diesel. 
if they get electricity from the grid, it was 10 rupees per kilowatt hour. Now this solar power, which is going to cost less than 3 rupees per kilowatt hour, can be a game changer in the economics of the rural sector in terms of cold storages and people are going for uh, many of these. Problems will come, but this is where milk chillers and even push carts are being designed in the informal sector which has a solar at the top and a refrigerated section because the push cart fellow who sells and uh, in the evening whatever is left uh, in a temperature of 40 degrees, 44 degrees centigrade, the quality goes down. So how can you provide him? The idea is not just getting efficient system of production. The idea is also inclusiveness into that model. Otherwise, in a country which has teeming millions and small holders, if it is only the big business that does, then it may be comparative, but it will not be inclusive enough, and therefore the issues of poverty and inequality will come back on the table. So the challenge for India is competitiveness, but also inclusiveness, and now the challenge is sustainability along with that. So these are the challenges that we are facing. Think about it. John would be familiar with this. We were looking at the labor, farm labor is becoming expensive. Last six, seven years, the farm wages in nominal terms were increasing between 15 to 20 percent per annum. And that made an inflection point in Indian history where labor is becoming expensive and capital will be relatively cheaper. And there is a massive infusion of capital into agriculture. Now, as capital comes into agriculture, the problem is, what is the holding size? So, if you want to bring in some of these tractors and harvest combines and others, how a man of 1.15 hectare going to afford that? And India sells about 600,000 tractors a year, all these companies. But now the new model that is coming is, if you and me can have the benefit of Uber taxis, why the farmers can't have benefit of Uber tractors, Uber harvest combines, and that is where these four companies, uh, the biggest one, Mahindra and Mahindra, which controls about 40 to 45 percent of the tractor market in the country, is very aggressively coming forward. And some states like Rajasthan, about 900 centers, uh, Tefe is opening, 550 about Mahindra is opening, and so on and so forth. So you just give a call, and machinery will arrive, you get your service done, pay for that, and done with it. So this is an innovation, I would say. How to use capital more efficiently with smallholder economy. That's the type of thing which will bring about efficiency. Uh, there was talk about uh, innovations in uh, agro-services, uh, digital agriculture. Uh, the biggest players, Tata Consultancy or Mahindra and Mahindra, again, my agri-guru, uh, they have applications where they can send you on each farmer on their mobiles the weather services or the price, so what is the price today, in which market, all those types of services are being provided. Let me give you this little example of uh, onion is a very, very touchy thing in India. It's used in everyday uh, cooking. And uh, the price of onion, when it goes up, it can deseat, uh, it can uh, unseat uh, a garment. It has done in the past. So it's very, very uh, critical. We have three crops in a year. The crop that comes has to be the largest crop, then has to be stored for five months. The traditional storage that we used to have, uh, which will be with the bamboos and a platform, if it was too dry, there will be a massive weight loss. And if it is moisture in the air, uh, the sprouts will come. So the typical wastage was about 25 to 30 percent. 25 to 30 percent. But the latest technologies of cold storage that have come at 4 degrees, they have reduced the wastage from 25 to less than 5 percent. And uh, these, when I saw this particular cold storage, it was still running on uh, grid electricity and when the grid electricity doesn't come uh, on diesel. But now they are going 
all solar independent of the grid and they can use much of the, so the cost efficiency uh, starts increasing. Uh, this is also the next, uh, uh, what globally is happening that in India also has started inching forward and uh, we are looking at uh, different types of precision agriculture, sensors, unmanned uh, aerial uh, vehicles, uh, robotics and uh, big data, uh, internet of things and so on and so forth. So all those things are coming in. Uh, you may have read, uh, you know, very recently India uh, launched a satellite, uh, in fact launched 104 satellites simultaneously in one go. Uh, this was just two more slides. Uh, this was one of the most cost-effective method, and 80 of those uh, satellites were literally of Planet Labs in the U.S. Uh, they were coming here because of the cost efficiency, and uh, I think this drones and doves, doves, uh, all these cost-effective because we have the satellites. There is a limitation; it comes at the same place after. 23 days, so if you have to monitor the crops and use it for insurance purposes, you have to come down to what they call drones, and below that, uh, uh, you know, between drones and satellites, you have these doves uh, floating around. Uh, so much of the uh, private sector participation in crop insurance uh, is right underway. Uh, there are also innovations in agri-marketing and processing it is being realized that this brick and mortar, uh, the big box story of supermarkets, although it started off in India, it was doing a good growth, but there were some policy issues of FDI, direct FDI into that, and it was somewhat restrictive because of the opposition from the uh, mom and pop stores. But very surreptitiously, e-commerce is allowed. So from Amazon to Alibaba to everybody is getting into that. And they are also getting into agri-products. So instead of brick and mortar big box stores, you are leapfrogging directly and reaching the consumers through this, which is uh, pretty cost effective. So what is the story, the last slide? Uh, what is the outlook of 2017 and beyond? Uh, as I said, the, this particular year, we don't know what the monsoon would be. If El Nino again strikes, it may be uh, tough for India, but 1617, which has given a bumper harvest. As I speak here today, farmers are selling their tomatoes, potatoes, onions, cabbages, uh, cauliflower, all less than five cents a kg. All less than five cents a kg. So the prices have collapsed. Pulses prices compared to last year have come down by 50%, 50% a drop in the prices. So that's the amount of, so what you need is a lot of storage facilities, a lot of processing facilities and so on and so forth if we have to go. And that's where the business is likely to be. There is a challenge, but that's one should do. I think with the new government, there are challenges, but the mood of the country is upbeat. Despite demonetization of 86% of our currency, India is still going strong at 7% per annum. Overall growth, and I think agriculturally, we'll be able to feed our people in a respectable manner. Thank you very much.